The intent of this video is to review and explain the construction, purpose, and usage of cluster fragmentation bombs adopted during World War II. We will also look at a couple case studies where fragmentation bombs were dropped on the enemy and address what the Germans thought of being on the receiving end of these deadly bombs. This chart from a declassified 1950 United States Air Force document titled Bombs for Aircraft shows the categories of damage or impacts bombs can have. This includes blast or air shock peak pressure, fragmentation, ground earth shock, incendiary, and interdiction. Airdrop fragmentation bombs are designed to maximize the fragmentation damage. Sometimes to completely annihilate a target and enemy personnel, the bomb loadout included all three types of bomb categories as discussed in this 1945 document titled A Report on Combat Operations of the 19th Tactical Air Command. In discussing the air attack supporting advancing ground troops, villages were encountered. The villages were attacked one by one, adopting high explosives, fragmentations, and then incendiaries. The fleeing enemy could then be strafed. The 19th had the sequence of attacks down to a science with 12 attacking aircraft, four aircraft loaded with 500-pound general-purpose demolition bombs, four with fragmentation clusters, and four with incendiaries, attacked the village in that order. The GP bombs to damage and expose the houses, fragmentations to wound or kill those fleeing from the village, and napalm to set fire to what was remaining of the village. This table lists the type and quantity of bombs dropped by the U.S. during the years 1943 through 1945 from a 1945 Office of Statistical Control document titled Army Air Forces Statistical Digest. This includes general purpose 67%, fragmentation 12%, incendiary 21%, and armor piercing type at 0.5%. This table lists a number of fragmentation bombs and clusters dropped in World War II by weight class. The most popular non-cluster fragmentation bomb adopted was a 260-pound M81 fragmentation bomb. It represents 97% of all non-cluster fragmentation bombs dropped. A cutaway of the M81 is shown here for reference. The 120 pound class cluster type fragmentation bomb is the most common type of bomb representing 89% of all fragmentation cluster bombs dropped. The 120 pound class AN-M1A2 cluster type is shown on this image. The AN-M1A2 cluster contains six M41 fragmentation bombs. 20 M41s could be loaded into the larger M26 cluster type. The larger M26 cluster type is slung under this wing of a P47. This image from a 1944 U.S. War Department document titled Bombs for Aircraft shows a size comparison of the M81 260-pound fragmentation bomb, 90-pound M82, and the 20-pound M41. Most of the fragmentation bombs dropped in clusters were M41s, and this will be the focus of this video. This chart outlines the targets and functions of fragmentation bombs. The bombs are heavy exterior cased and used against personnel and light structures. Upon detonation, the bomb's heavy case fractures into thousands of small fragments. Their fuses are set for instantaneous detonation at target contact. For low altitude release, use a parafrag. For high altitude release, use fragmentation bombs with stabilizing fins. The bomb's explosive fill container is a thick steel cap attached to a thin steel cylinder. The bomb's outer body is made from a thick steel helix coil. The bomb's nose fuse is contact triggered. The tail assembly contains a stabilizing fin or parachute. Large fragmentation bombs adopt a tail fuse in addition to a nose fuse. Let's review characteristics and operation of the 20-pound M41 fragmentation bomb. This chart from a 1945 U.S. Navy bomb disposal document outlines characteristics and provides an image of the components and a cutaway of the M41 fragmentation bomb. Overall, the bomb is 19.5 inches in length, 5.1 inches in width, and weighs 20.3 pounds. The bomb's explosive fill is 2.7 pounds of TNT. The bomb adopted the AN-M110A1 nose fuse. The M41 does not have a tail fuse. The explosive fill is within the seamless inner cylinder. A 0.5 inch thick steel wire is wrapped over the inner cylinder. The bombs are not dropped individually. They are always mounted in clusters of usually 6 or 20. The safe drop altitude equates to 400 feet. If dropping from altitudes lower than 400 feet, then use the M40 parafrag bomb. 
All heavy bombers release their bombs from altitudes greater than 400 feet. This image shows a B-25 medium bomber dropping M-40 parafrags on a New Guinea Japanese airfield in 1944. Parafrags have the additional advantage of detonating in a vertical orientation, which provides more uniform fragmentation coverage, more accurate targeting, and the rate of fall is slow enough to minimize any ground penetration at detonation. This chart outlines the characteristics of the M110A1 nose fuse. The fuse starts a detonation of the M41's 2.7 pounds of TNT at contact. No time delay between fuse target contact and detonation. The fuse is armed after 260 vein revolutions. This chart outlines characteristics of fragmentation clusters from a 1945 National Defense Research Committee document titled Weapons Data, Fire Impact Explosion. The columns are the cluster designation, number and type of fragmentation bombs held, weight class, cluster fusing, weight in pounds, dimensions in inches, and notes. The M1A2 cluster is loaded with six M41 bombs. The fall-up weight equates to 125 pounds and has no cluster release fuse. It is 8.8 .8 inches in diameter and 46.6 inches in length. This chart provides a description and release sequence of the six M41s from the M1A2 cluster from a 1960 Chief of Bureau of Naval Weapons document titled Aircraft Bombs and Fuses and Associated Components. The M1A2 and A3 clusters are the quick opening frame type. The bombs are released from the frame by withdrawing the arming wire from the release mechanism. The strap release mechanism is located here. This image shows characteristics of the larger M26 cluster, which holds 20 M41 bombs. The cluster is 53.5 inches in length, 14.7 inches wide, and its loaded weight equates to 415 pounds. It can be configured for quick or time delay M41 release from the cluster. For quick release, the arming wire it will be pulled back through the release buckles when the cluster is dropped from the plane's bomb shackle. For time delay release, a cluster 155 time fuse is needed. The 20 bombs are released from the cluster by detonation of the cluster canister's M155 fuse. This detonation action drives a steel slug located in the frame, which cuts the shear wire, releasing the buckles. This B24 is releasing M41 fragmentation bombs. This page lists characteristics and components of the M155 time fuse. The M155 fuse releases the M41 fragmentation bombs from the cluster. Key points are, firing delay can be set from 5 to 92 seconds after cluster release from the plane. This action will release the 20 M41s from the cluster at 6 to 9 vein revolutions to arm the fuse. The booster cup contains 120 grains of a black powder. To summarize, if a cluster contains 20 M1 fragmentation bombs, then it is the M26 model. If no fuse is attached to the M26's upper tubular support, then the fragmentation bombs will be released from the cluster at cluster release from the airplane. If the M26 cluster's frame tube does have an M155 fuse attached, then the entire cluster will be released from the plane and the 20 M1 fragmentation bombs will separate from the tumbling cluster after the fuse time countdown, which will have been preset to a duration between 5 and 92 seconds. Time fuses allow for predicted optimized ground fragmentation blast patterns. The damage fragmentation bombs can inflict on targets is described on this page from a 1944 Terminal Ballistics Document Volume 1. Fragmentation damage is characterized by casualties, perforation of mild steel plates of thicknesses of 1 8th, 1 4th, and 1 half inch. A casualty is defined by fragmentation projectile hitting with an energy of 58 foot-pounds. For reference, 58 foot-pounds of energy is roughly a 22 caliber long rifle bullet strike from 300 yards. This value is based on a 22 caliber ballistic table obtained from the net. Being struck with a fragment of this energy is likely incapacitation, not necessarily death. Fragment perforation of a 1 8 inch thick mild steel sheet would be effective against aircraft parked on the ground. Perforation of a quarter to half inch steel plate is effective against trucks, light armored vehicles, and rolling railway stock. 
This chart from a June 1943 Assistant Chief of Air Staff Intelligence report titled Impact describes the distribution of fragment numbers and weights from the detonation of a single M41 fragmentation bomb. The total number of bomb fragments will vary from 1,000 to 1,500. The 1,384 fragment sizes were as follows. 898 fragments with weights between 0 and 75 grains. For reference, a 22 caliber long rifle bullet is 40 grains. 388 between 75 and 150 grains. 96 between 150 and 750 grains. And two fragments were between 750 and 2,500 grains. This table outlines the M41's fragment to either cause a casualty or perforate a 1 8 inch thick mild steel sheet. Initial fragment velocity equates to 2,810 feet per second or Mach 2.5. From a distance of 100 feet, the bomb expels 882 fragments capable of at least 58 foot-pounds worth of energy. This equates to 0 0.0115 strikes per square foot on average. A standing human will expose 4.2 square feet of projected surface. So standing at this distance, a human has a 5% chance of being hit with a fragment that would cause a casualty. The 4.2 square foot exposure area was extracted from a U.S. Army wound ballistic table. The M41's combat effectiveness can be compared to a World War II pineapple style hand grenade. A detonated hand grenade will have 30 fragments capable of causing a casualty at 100 feet or 0 .0002 hits per square foot. The M41 fragmentation bomb will be 57 times more effective in causing a casualty as a hand grenade at a 100 foot distance from the detonation site. This effectiveness will vary with distance. This chart shows the zones of casualty risk based on an M41 bomb dropped from a 20,000 foot altitude striking the ground at an angle of 84 degrees. The zones are at least one fragment strike every square foot, four square feet, and 10 square feet of area. This chart shows a uniform fragmentation coverage of a parafrag landing at a 90 degree angle. So what would be the best application for these fragmentation bombs? If your goal is to destroy enemy aircraft on the ground, motor transport, and or enemy personnel, there is no equal to the 20 pound M41 cluster fragmentation bomb as discussed on this page from a 1945 Army Air Forces Evaluation Board document. They can be dropped in great concentrations over large areas. Direct hits are not required given their fragmentation effective zone. They have proven themselves in damaging parked aircraft beyond repair. The tables that follow list the clustered M41s as the preferable bombs to be dropped based on the target type. From a 1944 Joint Army-Navy Committee document titled Selection of Bombs and Fuses for Bombardment Targets. For aircraft in the open, exposed, or canvas hangars, the M41s are best for low, dive, medium, or high altitude attacks. Parafrags are best for minimum altitude release below 400 feet. This bomb type recommendation also extends to supply and communication trucks, radar, cars, wagons, exposed personnel, combat troops in foxholes, slit trenches, and open trenches, also anti-aircraft and open artillery in revetments. Artillery pieces are ringed with circular revetments. This image shows a type of target frag clusters would be ideal in attacking a 50mm and 155mm caliber non-enclosed guns. A hit within the circle would be critical. The M41 frag bombs are the only munitions to ensure hits from high altitude release. The fragmentation damage will disable guns up to 105mm in caliber. Another advantage to using fragmentation bombs over general purpose bombs is discussed on this page from a May 1945 Assistant Chief of Air Staff Intelligence document titled Impact U.S. Tactical Air Power in Europe. Advancing ground troops want enemy positions destroyed, but do not hamper the roads with craters, making them unusable. Fragmentation bombs both excel in causing enemy psychological issues without road cratering. 
Let's take a look at a few case studies where cluster fragmentation bombs were used effectively. The Sicilian airfield was attacked on April 13, 1943 by 23 B-17s dropping 3,312 M-41 fragmentation bombs from an altitude of 20,000 feet. The airfield is shown in this image prior to the attack. Of the 112 enemy aircraft at the airfield, 51 were destroyed and another 7 were damaged from the 20-pound fragmentation bomb. Multiple structures were also hit by fragments. One U.S. plane was lost during the mission. Upon detonation, the bomb's fragments tend to spray up at angles of 3 to 5 degrees, as shown in this image. Images of the attack with planes burning. This Milo Sicilian airfield was attacked on April 5, 1943 by 28 B-17s dropping 3,696 M-41 fragmentation bombs from an altitude of 13,000 feet. No U.S. aircraft were lost. The M-41s are deadly. The airfield was shredded with 5 million steel fragmentations. Three-fifths of the fragments were equivalent to a 30 caliber bullet, or in other words, the attack was comparable to firing 3 million 30 caliber bullets from 60 yards. This chart shows the Milo airfield prior to the attack. This drawing shows the zones of the M41 bomb strikes. Of the 120 aircraft on the field, 51 were claimed destroyed by this attack. The effect of carpet bombing German troops with fragmentation clusters is described on this page from a June 1945 assistant chief of the air staff intelligence document titled Impact. The morale effect was shattering. I've been a soldier for six years and I will never forget that day. What have I done to deserve this? These are typical German POW statements who experienced the April 9, 10, 1945 fragmentation carpet bombing attack. Their positions were attacked with 143,385 M41 fragmentation bombs. 98.9% .9 of the bombs fell within or near the assigned target area, as shown on this bomb pattern map. 1,673 heavy bombers were dispatched to support this raid. The carpet bombing of German positions was repeated again on April 15, 1945 with the same results. This image shows the carpet bombing of German gun positions and troop concentrations. Over the two-day attack, 317,205 M41 fragmentation bombs were dropped on German positions. On April 15, 1945, B-29s were sent to firebomb Tokyo. The bomb loadout is described in the tactical mission report. 5% of the loadout would be a 500-pound class fragmentation cluster bomb. The clusters were fused to open 1,000 feet below the release altitude. The M26's fuse timer was set to around 10 seconds. Bombing altitude was at 8,000 feet. The fragmentation bombs would disrupt firefighters and provide a harassing effect. This B-29 bomb bay is loaded with a single M26 fragmentation cluster surrounded by napalm incendiary clusters. On later firebomb missions, the loadout eliminated the fragmentation clusters, as discussed on this page from a May 15, 1945 tactical mission report. Fragmentation bombs were not loaded during the May 15 firebomb mission to Nagoya, since they would take the space of a firebomb cluster canister, and the M69 napalm firebombs would be sufficient to overwhelm the Japanese firefighters anyway. In summary, fragmentation bombs are very effective in destroying light vehicles and aircraft on the ground. They can also inflict massive casualties under ideal targeting conditions and cause duress on enemy personnel. If you found this weapon study and usage review informative, please consider commenting, liking, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.